Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 27th of September. Just a quick intro to what this video is about so you can decide if you want to watch. We've known for a long time now that perhaps over half of women who have mRNA COVID vaccinations can experience some form of menstrual disturbance or abnormality in, in their regular uh, menstrual periods. That's been known for some time, well established. Why this hasn't been acted on more by the authorities, uh, why the mechanisms haven't been very closely elucidated and studied by authorities is, is, to be quite honest, a bit of a mystery. But what hasn't been done up until now, and literally just a few days ago this was published, a study from Norway looking at women who don't normally menstruate. So this is premenopausal women who are on oral contraception, and that can alter and prevent menstruation depending on the protocol. Perimenopausal women who can menstruate very uh, irregularly and eventually, of course, will stop menstruating. And of co course, postmenopausal women who obviously don't uh, menstruate at all. And it's found that after mRNA vaccines in this Norwegian study, um, postmenopausal women, 3.3% had some form of menstrual symptoms after COVID vaccination. Perimenopausal women, 14% had some menstrual change after or increased menstruation after the mRNA vaccine. And in uh, premenopausal women, as we say, who are on some form of uh, oral contraceptive normally, premenopausal women who don't menstruate, 13.1% had this change. Huge amounts. And yet this hasn't been brought to the surface now since, well, for over two and a half years of vaccination, quite a incredibly, uh, incredibly slow, but at least we've got something now in the peer-reviewed literature, so let's dive straight into that now. So, unexpected vaginal bleeding and COVID vaccination in non-menstruating women, women who do not normally menstruate. So, but just before, well, this is from Science Advances. Now, just before we get into the subject matter, Altered bleeding patterns after COVID-19 vaccination has been, been frequently addressed in other studies in, in menstruating women. So this study here, Menstrual Abnormalities After COVID Vaccination, a Systematic Review, this was published in 2022. Um, a total of 78,138 vaccinated women were looked at and uh, 14 studies altogether. And... Um, 39,759, that's 52.7%, had some form of menstrual problem after vaccination. And yet, the authorities didn't see this as justification for stopping mRNA vaccines in women. Uh, you might think that's uh, quite uh, incredible that that is the case. So very common in, in women generally. As we say, this is looking at non-menstruating women. So Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Association between COVID-19 vaccine and vaginal bleeding, which we believe, we're not actually told, but we do believe this is endometrial type of bleeding from, from the uterus, as you would normally get in a menstrual period, of course. And among non-menstruating women is not well studied. Now, they came up with three things. The first one they found was menorrhagia. Now, menorrhagia is, is uh, heavy periods, an increase in the amount of blood loss. Not good in itself. That can contribute towards anemia, for example. Another thing they found was a metarrhagia. Meta, meta means change. So this is irregular periods, particularly bleeding between periods. And the other thing they found was a polymenorrhea. Uh, now, po po polymenorrhea is is uh, short, short cycles, so less than 21 days. And of course, if the cycle is uh, short, then there's going to be more of them. So poly meaning many, many uh, menstrual cycles. So these are the three things that they found. Now, several cohorts were followed through the pandemic in Norway, so, so that was good. Systematic data collection, self-reporting, and of course, uh, women are very, uh, very able to very accurately report their uh, menstrual patterns, of course. So we can be pretty assured by the validity of, of this data. Percentage experience unexplained vaginal bleeding during a period of eight to nine months. Now this follow-up here, the follow-up here was eight to nine months after vaccination. 
and 50% of these abnormal bleeding patterns were in 28 days of vaccination. So most of these happen within a month, uh, the, the, the month as you would expect really, uh, of the, uh, the mRNA vaccine being given. But of course that means 50% didn't. So there was a delay of eight to nine months in 50% of cases. Now to me, that means that the vaccine is having some effect in the physiology of the woman's body eight to nine months after the vaccination was given, meaning some physiological effect of the vaccine was around for that amount of time. We were told it would be broken down probably within a few hours in the arm. One of the reasons I'm uh, displeased uh, and many of you are displeased is because we weren't given the full information and when people didn't know the full information early on they didn't have the humility to admit what was not known it was blagged is the way I, the expression i was used where there was a deficit of information it was kind of glossed over quite inexcusable uh, you might use the term uh, reckless but anyway let's let's go on with uh, what happened here. So 50% had this huge uh, delay. What was the vaccine doing in the body during all that time? What other effects was it having? I mean, I mean, a change to uh, a change to menstruation is a very obvious thing to see. Were there other effects in the body during this eight to nine month period that we know of where the vaccine was having other effects? We only know what this paper tells us. But it does say there was effects of the vaccine to me physiologically for eight to nine months, not what we were told. Anyway, in, in 7,725 postmenopausal women, 3.3% had menopausal symptoms. That's big. Uh, similar so cohort size, uh, perimenopausal women, round about the end of their menstruating lives, 14.1%. Postmenopausal women, 13.1%. Now, in postmenopausal women, the risk of unexplained vaginal bleeding in the four weeks after vaccination was increased two, uh, two to threefold. So two to three times as many as you would expect. So doubling and tripling quite a lot. Um, and now there's another study here which shows... Um, then this study was 3.3%, wasn't it? So, so there's another study here shows that this could be as high as 11.1 after the first vaccine and 37.5 after the second vaccine. So the, the percentages here do vary quite a bit. So from 3.3% in one study up to 11.1 uh, .1 and 37.5% in another study. So quite a bit of variability Surely you would think that national agencies would have huge scale data on this. They've had two and a half years to collect it. Why are we still unsure about the figures? Somewhere between 3.3 and 37%. Come on. I think we can do better than that, but it would appear not. We can do better than that, but so far we haven't done better than that. Disappointing, I would have said. Now, in non-menstruating, perimenopausal and pre-menopausal women um, the risk of unexpected this is this is often called breakthrough bleeding after vaccination three to five times more common so a lot more common three to five times more common pre-menopausal women um, the Moderna uh, was associated with a 32 percent increased risk compared to the uh, Pfizer so both both bo happened in both vaccines but the the, uh, the spike of acts, the uh, Moderna one, it was more common. Now, a bit more detail. A report since 2020, menstrual disturbances at frequencies not seen in previous vaccination campaigns. Now, let's be clear, clear about this. This is, the, these, res, these effects have not been seen in previous vaccination campaigns. This is something which is new to the mRNA vaccines. To me, this is ringing an alarm which is loud and clear. Anything that's to do with bleeding or blood clotting to me is a red flag. Not apparently to our regulatory authorities, but you can decide how important it is to you. To me, it's very significant. Hemostasis is, is, uh, is just it's a vital thing we always take into account every day in healthcare, but apparently not at the national level. So not seen in previous uh, vaccination campaigns. 
Such events were not addressed in the preceding clinical vaccine trials. So um, given that, oh, I don't know, half the population are women, female at least, um, you would have thought that they'd want to account for this aspect of health in 50% of the human population, but they didn't bother including it in the trials. Didn't bother. It just wasn't there. Quite, quite, quite incredible. When you look back, it's really quite incredible that this wasn't there. European Medicines Agency at last recently updated product information on the mRNA vaccines to include heavy menstruation bleeding as a potential side effect. And as we've seen, a disappointingly common one with over 50% of women getting menstrual changes after the uh, COVID vaccines. Right. Uh, post, um, post-menopausal bleeding, PMB, post-menopausal bleeding can be a symptom of endometrial carcinoma and percutaneous lesions. Now, I always say to my students, whenever a postmenopausal woman complains of bleeding, that's an automatic referral to the gynecologist. You need to tell the GPs, get them to the gynecologist and work out why. Postmenopausal women are not supposed to bleed. If they do, it can be a sign of an internal cancer or what, 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 what this study here calls a, a percutaneous lesion. Now, percutaneous means through the surface. But what it really means is that there's usually a metaplastic tissue. So this is a tissue that's has changed. It's not like the original tissue. It's not quite a cancer. It's somewhere halfway in between the two, but it's got the potential to become a cancer. So either way, the gynecologists need to know about this and treat this in these women. So it's always a red flag. So it's, it's just always been a hugely significant feature. Postmenopausal women aren't supposed to PB bleed. Um, and yet this has been happening. Now, um, so it can be a symptom of these things. This is why the differential diagnosis here is so important. Really, any, any postmenopausal woman who's, who, who's had a bleed should be checked out by a gynecologist. That's the only safe uh, way to do it. They can have a look and see if there's any uh, malignant or pre-malignant lesions there. And you're right, uh, women with postmenopausal bleeding should be referred to specialised gynaecological examination. This is what we've always taught. So there we are, we've known about the menstrual changes in women that normally menstruate. We also find now there's changes in women who don't normally menstruate. And I feel it should be a matter of urgency to elucidate the mechanisms as to what's going on here. Because in a sense, with female bleeding, it's kind of fairly obvious, but maybe with changes to male bleeding or male blood clotting, it's often uh, less obvious. Are the same things going on? These questions urgently need uh, answered, I would have thought. Um, but I'm not aware of any official government projects uh, to study this at the present time. You might think that's disappointing. I think it's disappointing. And for now, thank you for watching.